Hey, I'm Shane Varco, the Executive Director of the Delgano Institute. Welcome to our Delgano Institute's no-brainer resiliency building sessions. Welcome back to session two of our reward and exploration set. This is part two from thermometer to thermostat. We're gonna kick in with some science pretty much straight up here. So another word for experimentation is how to make yourself a thermometer. Several emerging theories of addiction have described how substance use exploits vulnerabilities in the decision-making process. I want you to hear that. Substances exploit your decision-making. These vulnerabilities, they create weaknesses, right? These weaknesses have been said to result in what they call a pharmacologically corrupted neural mechanism of normal brain valuation systems. That's a scientific way of saying this messes with your actual physical decision-making process in your brain. That doesn't help with maturation. That doesn't help with smart choices. That doesn't help with development at all. It's contrary to that. High alcohol intake in rats during adolescence has seen to show an increase in risk preference, leading to really underdeveloped performance of the decision-making process, even into adulthood. So this is really scary. So th this, this kind of conduct engaging with substances for the brain and the decision-making, which is already working, trying to work things out, is really, really dangerous. And it actually undermines you not just now, but moving forward into, into adulthood. A history of adolescent alcohol use alters the dopamine signaling to risk and not reward. In other words, the substance says to the brain, ah, the risk isn't that bad, isn't that bad, isn't that bad. But the rewards, the reward's awesome, the reward's awesome, the reward's awesome. That's what the chemical's telling your brain. Totally contrary to the realities in front of you. So, driving the car drunk or teetering on the edge of a building to show off, all those things become less dangerous, but the reward for the social kudos and being funny gets through the roof. You can see how incredibly out of whack this is and how dangerous it is. But it's not just the short term, those decisions can really damage you, but the long term, because what it does is alter your long term evaluation of risk. In other words, you cannot be smart about moving forward and looking about decision making going, and think about all the outcomes and then come back and make a decision. You don't think about the outcomes, you just think about the immediate reward. So risk preference following adolescent alcohol use is associated with corrupted encoding of costs, but not rewards. That's really, really important, guys, because at this age, you don't need that corruption in your brain. So again, what they call appraisal disruption, really important you guys get this. One thing about the current, sometimes the current education process is that there's this idea that kids don't get this. You guys need to get this, particularly at this age. What they call appraisal disruption. In other words, your ability to appraise a situation, to think about all the angles and get all the information you need to make the smartest choices you can about an issue is disrupted by substance use. In fact, grotesquely disrupted. It messes you up big time. So your ability to make, find out the best data, find out the best options and make the best choice are all interfered with because of substance use. And already with a brain that's developing trying to figure this stuff out. We understand from some of the latest research that the granule cells in the brain, get this guys, the cells in the brain, there's over 60 billion of these, can be encoded, can be encoded with reward responses, not just the anticipated rewards either. So your brain's programmable guys, and at this age very much so. Unexpected rewards in recent experiments saw increases in reward response, thus driving greater cellular need for reward. So reward is important, we really need that, but if you have a false or a fake reward, such as a, a stimulus that is chemical, then the brain picks up on that and wants more of it and starts to encode the cells. We need more of this. So this is at a cellular level, guys. This is pretty full on. Now this is both good news and bad news for the developing brain. When you introduce an artificial reward, such as a chemical buzz, the recipe, as we've talked about previously, the recipe is getting messed with, and your resiliency rope and the developmental wheelbarrow get poor, damaged, or disruptive messaging and coding. And remember, at your age, this cannot be stated enough, long enough, loud enough. This is so important because this can last a lifetime, guys. The way the brain develops now, really, really important. 
So if you already have, sadly for some of us, and I get this, you have few boundaries, you have poor values, or no values, in other words, do whatever you feel. You have toxic relationships that are harmful and disruptive and are unhelpful and they and they create insecurity in you and fear and or, or carelessness, or recklessness. And they're already in play, then many of the positive rewards your bio brain system really needs are already missing or corrupted. And that's not necessarily your fault. I get, I get that. It's just not your fault. And it's easy to see how the chemical reward mechanism, once it's engaged, it's set up to be hijacked, especially by substances. And you really, we just can't labor this point enough. It's right here, right now that you're, you're feeling like rubbish, things aren't great, it's pretty toxic. And someone says, here, try this, to make you feel better. I get it. And for the most part, there will be a feel good component in that. Sure, there's a lot of negatives with that. And I could sit here and tell you many stories about first time use, second time use, how incredibly awful they are. But at some point there is a, I felt better. And there's your problem. Then the brain starts to, and the cells of the brain start to go, I want this reward. That is powerful. And that kind of influence makes you a thermometer and all of a sudden you're stuck in a cycle. Time for quote of the moment. This is a quote by a world-renowned coach, life coach, uh, remarkable individual has written a lot on this particular subject. His name is Sir John Whitmore. And he said, I am able to control only that which I am aware of. That which I am unaware of controls me. Awareness empowers me. That's really important. That's why we're doing what we're doing with this stuff, guys, is we want to empower you with awareness. Awareness about the science, awareness about some of the factors that influence your decision-making, awareness about what turns you into a merely a thermometer that follows whatever's going on, and change that to turn you into a thermostat where you start to make seriously good decisions about your future and your life and those around you. So that's a really important. Now, moving on from that, fixing the disruption. Remember I said it was good news? and bad news. We talked about the bad news. Sadly, stuffing you up, stuffing me up in adolescence is pretty easy to do. That's, that's the scary thing. We're supposed to be protected. The adults, the grown-ups in our environment are supposed to protect us. We're supposed to set up environments where we can make the smartest, best decisions so we don't get screwed up, messed up, chaotic, and damage ourselves permanently. That's what supposed to, grown-ups are supposed to do. But if the grown-ups are still playing in adolescence, they don't care. They just do whatever. And they create environments that just don't care either. And all of a sudden, you're making these decisions. But as we've said before, with the recipe model and with the brain and with the body, yes, it can be recalibrated. But as I said, messing you up is easy and quick. Fixing you takes a lot more work and a lot more time. And that's the scary thing. And we work a lot with the recovery alumni, those who have gone into addiction and come out. And their journey out of this is quite scary. We'll talk more about that later. However, if you've dabbled in drugs, maybe you have, maybe you've just had a few hits here and there, you've tried weed or you've tried an ecky or whatever, it's really important that we intervene right now because part of you is going, yeah, well, I, I can manage this, I, I'm okay. Your reward system's starting to justify itself. It's starting to say, I can manage this, I can do this, I can cope. I'm not too bad, my parents don't know. Uh, you know I'm, I'm doing okay at school. But what's happening is your brain's starting to say, no, I want to guard this. I want, I want to keep onto this fake reward. So I'm missing out on the real rewards. And, I, and I, instead of exploring what is good, right and true, I'm starting to experiment more with stuff that is going to be a shortcut. Of course, fixing this mess is doable, as we've said, it is doable. But as we've discovered, and we'll discover more, you have to actually learn all these things again. The brain has to relearn. So all the things you're shortcutting now to avoid learning, so you can get the shortcut to feel good, the reward, you have to actually relearn because the brain has to be recalibrated. And chemical recalibration doesn't work. It just doesn't work on the brain. However, the capacity to encode those cells to delay reward, this is what the science says, was only achieved through active learning processes. As we've said, you've got to go back and learn it properly. Actions, good actions, right rewards, right exploration, not experimentation and rebellion. Again, even at a cellular level, we were designed to explore and find out what the best outcomes and rewards are. 
Or again, we can continue to shortcut our human computer by stimulating it with non-instructing chemical, what we call tutors. They're not helping you grow. They're not helping you be, they're not good teachers, mate. They're bad teachers. They are really nasty. And they diminish your capacity, grossly diminish your capacity to make wiser and smarter and beneficial long-term decisions. That's the science on this, guys, really important. So, time for a how not to say yes to me messing drugs. This particular clip is an excerpt from our Pate Girl DVD video curriculum. Worth listening to Jenna's story. When we were about 20 years old, we went out um, because we were heavily into the rave scene. We loved to party, absolutely loved the drugs as well. I honestly did not feel anything. I thought I was fine. And then all of a sudden I wake up in hospital one morning after being in a coma for three days. And then my mum told me I was in an accident. You know, I was so young, 20 years old. I had no idea how much trouble I was in. I just thought it was a really tragic accident. So what were the charges in the end? I got charged with one count of culpable driving, right. causing death. I got five years jail with two and a half years to serve. Sure. I lost just uh, my general direction in life. Obviously my best friend. I couldn't even walk. I had to learn how to walk again and um, speak again and uh, learn how to do daily things such as shopping. So just, yeah, my independence in general. After a while, I lost my freedom. I lost my licence, of course. Now I'm a 25 year old having to rely on my parents to drive me around and the bus. Well, it all started when I was about 14 years old. Okay. I put it down to the fact that I wanted to fit in and be popular. Actually, the guy who died in my car accident. Yeah, he goes, Jenna, come over to my place one night um, and, we'll, and we'll have some bongs. And I had no idea what that was at the time. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no education about it. Did you actually move into the hard drug space at any point? I did. I was only 15. I remember I had this boyfriend and uh, we were in his caravan and I can't even remember where it came from, but um, somehow we obtained some speed. And um, then I'd find myself venturing out in the city and not coming back for about three days and just being awake for three days, walking around and just doing nothing, you know, just being off my face with, these, with my boyfriend at the time and his mate. What happens after that? Oh, you just absolutely feel like crap and then you have to come home and face reality because eventually you do have to come home and face your family. Well, I did at the time because I was still living there. And uh, they'd say, where have you been? And I didn't even know how to answer that because not even I knew where I'd been. <laughs> what was I doing for the last three days? So physically sick? Haven't slept for three days, yeah. no food. Yuck. Yeah, <laughs> not a nice feeling. Things would seem so funny. Everything was just hilarious, even though it was we didn't even know what we were laughing about at the time. That's all I wanted. I just wanted fun, 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 with no consequences. And you think you're awesome friends because you're both off your face and just having a really great time. But then when some, something happens and they're not beside you in near your hospital bed, you realise who is and who really does care. The consequences of picking up that first cigarette or having that first bong. Because if I didn't have that first bong, where would I be now? I'd probably be a doctor. I was so smart. I was getting A grades my whole way through primary school and high school up until, you know, year eight. Think really, really hard about what you're doing because with that kind of stuff, you don't know where you're gonna end up. I would never have pictured myself being in prison, never. From the age of 14, just from making those small decisions, that's where it landed me. So time to push back, changing your context, becoming a thermostat. When we're pushing back against something, we need to have some energy and some warmth behind us. And so we wanna equip you with that as we move into ending this particular session. So the pushback starts with, with these five particular issues that we like to promote. You can add these to your resiliency building script 
as well in your journals. First one is, is my body. How not to say yes to me diminishing drugs. I'm not going to use gear of any kind, legal or illegal, that is going to let me be used or worse, use somebody else. Rebellion and experimentation almost always end up in someone being used somewhere by someone in really, really unkind and nasty ways. And that's something that should be in your prefrontal cortex, front of your brain. Number two, the environment. I care about the environment. I really do, I care about the planet. I'm not going to support an industry, and that's what it is, that is helping destroy our planet and the various species and even some people groups, which is what the illicit drug industry does. So I'm not gonna be part of that either. That's gonna be forefront in my brain as well. Trafficking, trafficking, awful, awful human trafficking, drug trafficking, human trafficking, intertwined. I'm not going to support a product or use a product that is used to exploit and then destroy women and children, which is exactly what illicit drugs do all over the world right now. And you do in your, or your group, your friends doing their weed or their, their eckies or their meth or their coke in the corner is not a victimless crime, it's awful. So I'm not gonna be part of that. Number four, violence. Illicit substances are, and, and legal, the legal drug of alcohol is incredibly and shockingly represented in the violence space, both familial and domestic and children and street violence. It is awful. So I'm not going to use a product that greatly adds to violence, ruins homes and breaks up families. I'm not gonna do that. And finally, getting back to the values driver, I'm gonna have good, strong values about what is right, what is true, what is gonna help me be the best person I can be, not just for myself, but for my community, for those around me. So that mine are stronger values. They're stronger than the threat. I know who I am and where I'm going and how to get there and how to reach my full potential. And drugs are not part of that journey. Now that's a good starting point to push back. So, Script builder takeaway for this session, for your journals, take some notes. I'm a thermostat, not a thermometer. My body, the environment, human rights, human trafficking, violence, and values. Take them down, continue to develop your resiliency script. We'll see you next time.